Hello again, this is Gary, and you might be wondering why I am making this video today. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, I grew some melons, and I also bought some at the local farm, and they were so bland that uh, I basically just threw them away. There was no sweetness to the melons at all. And so I decided to make a video today on how to grow the sweetest melons. Now, sweetness is one of the most important qualities of many, any kind of fruit. And I'll give you an example. Um, I had a friend of my wife's that bought some apples from us. And we allow our apples to ripen on the tree and build up a naturally high sugar content. And her daughter did not like apples. And uh, they ordered a, a half a bushel. And she ate just about every apple. And she said, Mom, these can't be apples. And one of the reasons why children don't eat their fruits at school is because they don't taste like anything. So sugar content in fruits is very important. Now we normally grade sugar content by something called the BRIX scale, B-R-I-X. And there's a refractometer that you can buy that will measure the sugar content in uh, various uh, fruits and vegetables. And what it actually does is it measures the percentage of solids, everything but water in the, in the fruit juice. And that includes things like the different types of sugars like glucose and fructose and all those sorts of things. Also amino acids, proteins, minerals, and vitamins. And sweeter fruits have a more complex flavor because of the level of these various materials that are in them. Now, bricks levels or sugar levels in fruits are determined by a number of different factors. And you can have good years and bad years, but these are the different things. One is the cultivar genetics. Two is the soil fertility. Three is your summer growing conditions in terms of your temperatures. Four would be your light exposure. Five, spacing. Six, disease. Watering would be the next one. And then finally, when you actually harvest your fruit. Now, when I go back to talking about bricks levels in terms of what is an actual sweet fruit, if you have a bricks level of 12, and I don't have a refractometer right now, but I'm going to order one, but um, they're not that expensive. They cost about $25 on up to like 200 depending on what kind you want to get. But a basic one will cost you about $20, $30. And a, a bricks level of 12 is considered pleasantly sweet. Most people would be happy with that. 14 would be considered very sweet. And finally, 16 is really maybe too sweet. I don't know. It, it depends on the person. Because I, I don't like super sweet. Like the sweetest sweet corn, I don't particularly care for because the sugar content is just too high. So let's get started. One of the first things we want to talk about is cultivar. Um, different varieties have... Uh, naturally are naturally sweeter because of their genetic composition. Now for instance I like to grow a, an heirloom variety called Honey Rock which is a pretty sweet melon but when it's ripe it tends to be a little softer than a lot of people would prefer nowadays. Uh, down the road at the farm uh, where I buy melons sometimes and sweet corn they grow one called Aphrodite and this year they were really sweet. I also grow one that's in the same vein in terms of it's named after a, a goddess, uh, one called Athena. So those are very sweet melons and I'm sure you all grow your types that are really sweet for you, but those are just some examples. So now in some of the catalogs, especially the commercial catalogs, they may actually list the bricks level on the different ones. You rarely see it in a, a consumer catalog. They'll just say this is super sweet or whatever the case may be and they don't put any kind of a actual measure to it. The next thing is soil fertility. You have to remember that the sugars are produced from a process called photosynthesis. That's where uh, you actually have the production of carbohydrates, which are basically a fancy word for saying sugars. And um, these sugars will then accumulate in the fruits, whether it's a tomato or watermelon or muskmelon or something like that. And in order to get good sugar content, you need a lot of lush leafy growth which means you're producing a lot of sugars in these leaves, which will then be shipped to your, your fruit. 
So um, in order to get this, your soil has to have the proper nutrients, both macronutrients, which would be the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and even the micronutrients, which would be things like uh, molybdenum, manganese, magnesium, things of that sort. There is also there are what we call secondary nutrients too. If I remember correctly, magnesium, calcium, and one other one's a secondary nutrient. But what this is telling you is how much these plants need. For instance, um, if you were a commercial grower and you were growing melons, uh, you might need to put on say 90 pounds of nitrogen per acre. And uh, <clears throat> if you want to know that on a per thousand square feet, just divide it by 43. And uh, actually 43.5. Secondary nutrients are required in lesser amounts. And micronutrients are required in very small amounts. Like uh, on a per acre basis, it might only be one or two pounds for an entire acre. And an, an acre is 43,560 square feet. So that's a pretty large area. So the best way to find out what the fertility level in your soil is to run a soil test. And that should be done about every three years. And um, depending on where you are, uh, you can go to your local extension office. It's usually called a cooperative extension office. In Michigan, it's called MSU Extension. And here in Michigan, we can go to the Michigan State University Extension Bookstore and we can order the soil testing kit that gives you all the things that you need. You just mail it back in. It's going to be different in different states. But they will give you the information as to not only what you have in your soil, but what you need. And I always like to include putting micronutrients back in the soil every year. You can use a liquid fertilizer, but most organic fertilizers like animal manures and things of that sort will have micronutrients in them because animals need micronutrients. And the majority of nutrients that they take in, they crap out the other end. The next thing you should do is sow your seed early. You want to make sure that you have plenty of time for those plants to grow during the warm weather since melons are warm weather crops. They do best when the soils are warm and the air is warm. And so we usually suggest that you start your seedlings about six to eight weeks before you plan to set them out if you're growing them yourself. And I have a series of about five or six videos on how to grow outstanding transplants. So check those out. Also, when you're getting ready to put them out, don't plant them until the night temperatures are at least 60 degrees or higher. Uh, warm season crops do not like cool nights and if it's too cool they will just sit there and not grow. Now if you're growing in a raised bed they will warm up faster and if you are protecting your seedlings with say a little um, tint over top of them like a plastic cover or something like that then you can get them out a little bit earlier but you certainly don't want the temperatures dropping down below 60s at night if you can help it. Another thing that's very important is full sunlight all day because sugars accumulate best when you have warm sunny days and cool nights. Now when I say cool nights we're talking about around the 60s or so. Um, that's ideal and if you want to warm up the soil earlier in the season you might want to put your plants on black plastic and or a landscape fabric. I prefer landscape fabric. Um, the thick ones because water will go through those and you don't have to worry about um, having problems like you would on black plastic that doesn't allow water down uh, around the plant roots. Spacing is also very important. So read the labels on your uh, seed packet to find out what is the ideal spacing for your plants because when they're not spaced properly, they're competing for water and nutrients. Also keep the weeds under control because you don't want the weeds to compete with your plants either. If you don't have a lot of room in your garden and you're not growing very large melons, then you can make a trellis and train them to grow upward on that trellis and then use supports to hold the melons in place. Watering is also very important and timing is very important in terms of when you water. Uh, what I usually suggest is water frequently using drip hoses and the drip hoses are right there at the base of the plant so you're not wasting water and encouraging weeds. Um, you should avoid overhead watering, especially in the evening. Overhead watering will encourage diseases. Also, as you're getting close to the time when the melons are ripening, then you want to cut back on the water. Just give them enough so that the leaves are not wilting. If you get a lot of rain just before uh, picking, the melons will pick up that water and will dilute out the sugars and the melons won't be as flavorful as they should be. 
also, in certain cases, the melons may actually split. Uh, some cultivars of watermelon will do this, especially smaller ones. You should also treat your plants to protect them from leaf diseases. Because if you have leaf diseases, primarily fungal diseases, this will uh, cause the leaves to die and dry up faster, and that's going to cause them to produce less sugar, which can result in less sweet melons. The final thing is when to pick your melons. Now, one of the indicators would be how many days till harvest that's listed on the seed packet. So if it says something like 78 days, they'll tell you if it's 78 days from seed or from transplanting. And let's say it's 78 days from transplanting. So what I would do is when you plant them, mark on the calendar roughly the time that you expect the melons to be ready. That way you can be checking them to be sure. Another thing is with musk melons, uh, they have a smell and they should smell like a melon. When I go to the grocery store and I smell melons and there's absolutely no smell at all, that's pretty much a guarantee that they're not gonna have much taste. <clears throat> Another thing, uh, the background color goes from green to kind of a beige color. And the melons themselves will be much heavier than you think they would be when you pick them up. Now for watermelon, I've made a video on that. So I'll just refer you to that video that'll tell you when you should pick watermelons. But I will say one thing about uh, that. I um, mentioned in that video that when you put your fingernail into the rind, it should be very difficult to put it in there. But I have uh, two varieties this year. One is called Mambo and uh, the other one's Baby Boy. Mambo is a smaller one. And I found that even though I can push my nail into the Mambo, it will still uh, be ready. So that's not the best indicator by itself for that particular cultivar. So those are some of the tips for growing sweet melons. And of course, some of it is uh, the luck of the draw when it comes to the weather. Uh, you can modify some of these things a little bit, but you can't control the weather. But many of these other things you can control and pretty much guarantee that you're gonna get sweeter melons than you would if you did nothing and just trusted whatever happened. This is Gary, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.